Welcome to Streams of Light. We are studying the Word of God. We are looking at common questions regarding the God we worship. This is question number 5 and it's coming from Isaiah 9 verse 6 which says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. So, this text has actually brought some controversy in some people's minds. They stick to this part which says the Everlasting Father. So they ask, who is the Father in the Bible? Well, we find it's called the Father. So, they say, when the Son is born, it's actually God the Father himself coming as the Son. Right? And when Jesus says, I'll send forth the Spirit, it's actually Jesus, it's the same God the Father who's coming as the Spirit. Like, it's God who came in the Old Testament as God the Father, then as Jesus, then as the Spirit. It's like three different modes, but the same being. As you would say, a man in a company would wear a hat and be called the owner of that company or the CEO. And then when he goes home, he's a father. When he goes to church, he's an elder, but it's the same person. So, this creates what we call mid-modalism, right? One God coming in three different phases right but one thing that is true is here we all agree that jesus is the mighty god we do all agree that christ is divine but when it says the everlasting father who is a father too because here it then says he's the prince of peace now a prince always has a king right so who is he the everlasting father too this is a very interesting topic and let's dive right into it so john 4 verse 19 says the woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive thou art a prophet. Now, here, John 4 was a very charged topic. It's a very charged topic and conversation because the Samaritans and the Jews had a very closely linked history, but they were not friendly to each other, as we shall see. So, the woman perceived something to say, You are a prophet. So she asked the question, John 4 20, Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you say that in Jerusalem is the place where we where men ought to worship. So there were two groups, the Samaritans and then the Jews. The Jews, we have to worship in the temple. The Samaritans, we have to worship in the mountain. So two different groups, two different worship styles, right? All centered in a place. Mm -hmm. So this question was asked to Christ, right? So before we can answer this, we have to understand who are the Jews and how did they come about. And then we shall look at how, who are the Samaritans, how they came about. So Speaking of the Jews, Deuteronomy 16, verse 16, he says, Three times in a year shall all thy males appear before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose. In the feast of unleavened bread, the feast of weeks, and the feast of tabernacles, and they shall not appear before the Lord empty. So, this is the wilderness soldier, and as they are moving f during the wilderness, God says, Look, I will choose a place where you shall all come unto me right in that place my name shall be there and all the males should come and appear before me notice when they went to the promised land um, later on all the Jews would be scattered abroad right but not only that when they entered the promised land the, the land would be divided up right some would be in different places so God in the promised land would choose a place whereby he name his name would be and they were supposed to come throughout all israel and come in this one central location and worship before the lord so they were come, supposed to come in the feast of an event bread feast of weeks which we know that it is pentecost as well as feast of temple so there were three times in the year they were supposed to come and worship before the lord right so Speaking still of the Jews, uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 6, uh, verses 5 and 6, it reads, Since the day that I brought forth my people out of the land of Egypt, I chose no city among all the tribes of Israel to build an house in, that my name might be there. Neither chose I any man to be a ruler over my people Israel. So we find that since they were come out and they were settled in this land, God did not choose any city where they were supposed to build him a house and no one was chosen to be a ruler right verse 6 2 Chronicles 6 6 says but i've chosen jerusalem that my name might be there and i've chosen david to be over my people so you find that david was chosen as an oversight right and only that jerusalem was the place that was chosen whereby god would have 
a person to build him a house you see so jerusalem has chosen david to be over the people right jerusalem the center of worship right so let's continue uh, 1 Kings 2 verse uh, 1 Kings 2 verse 16. Now, just to add context over this, we find that David had a son Solomon, and Solomon had a, another son whose name was Rehoboam. Now, Rehoboam was asked by the people to say, "Look, are you going to rule differently from your father? Because your father, that I was speaking of uh, um, Solomon, uh, he reigned over them in a strict way, right? So this man Rehoboam." counseled with the elder, elderly gentlemen so they told me hey, look make sure that you relax their taxes and all these things you know give them a good manifesto make them uh, feel warm towards you and then Rehoboam went to the youth and they told me hey, look you have to show them that you are the man you have to deal them with an iron grip iron fist and all these things of course Rehoboam was young he went to the council of the youth and what happened Israel was split and most of the people stopped uh, paying homage or allegiance to the house of David meaning him being a descendant of David or the grandson of David no longer had Israel unified and him as the one ruler but notice what is happening here 1 Kings 12 verse 16 it says so when all Israel saw that the king hearkened not unto them the people answered the king saying what portion have we in David neither have we inheritance in the son of Jesse to your tents O Israel now See to thine own house, David. So Israel departed unto their tent. So who is this Israel? Well, um, you find that there were 13 tribes which entered the promised land. But we only speak of 12 because Levites was not given any inheritance. They were supposed to just be secured and among Israelites to teach them about the law and to teach them about the uh, sacrifice system and all these things. And mainly they were there also in the temple to carry out these sacrifices, right? So the Levites were spread among the people and also their activities were centered in the temple. That's the Levites. So one tribe was out. Now, continue on, you find that the other 12 tribes, they were all Israel. But at this point in time, there was a split, right? Let's read 1 Kings 12, 17. But as for the children of Israel, which dwelt in the cities of Judah, Rehoboam reigned over them. So they were the children of Israel. Israel was Jacob, right? All his sons together were Israel. But at this point and juncture, what had happened is because Rehoboam did not listen to the people, he said he would still give them a hard time and all these things. Oh, they did complain to him to say, how are you going to rule? Because your forefathers taxed us to our teeth, right? Because he didn't listen to them, the ten tribes did not want to have Rehoboam over them, right? So they departed to their tents. Only Judah was the one which remained loyal to Rehoboam, right? And as we shall see, uh, also Levi. So what did Rehoboam do? So 1 Kings 12 verse 20, it says, And it came to pass when all Israel heard that Jeroboam was come again, that they sent and called him unto the congregation and made him king over all Israel. And there was none that followed the house of David but the tribe of Judah only. So we find that Jeroboam now was made king over the ten tribes. So the northern tribes, ten tribes, Jeroboam was made king. Whilst the southern tribes, that would be Judah, the, that part, that was where... Rehoboam reigned. So 1 Kings 12 to 20 says, And when Rehoboam was come to Jerusalem, he assembled all the house of Judah with the tribe of Benjamin. So we find that Judah was assembled, right? Judah was assembled with all the tribe of Benjamin. You say there was Benjamin and there was Judah. These were the ones which were together. And because Jerusalem was centered in the location where Judah was, the Levites were there, most like three tribes, right? But the rest of the ten tribes were in the hands of Jeroboam. So these ten tribes were called Israel. But uh, where Judah and um, Benjamin were together, they were called the house of Judah. You see, so there was Judah and then there was Israel. So there was a king of Judah, then there was a king of Israel. Two kings, right? Okay, so with that history, we'll continue. So let's talk, look at how the Samaritans came in now. If you read the history, you find that immediately the king of Israel found out, hey, look, three times a year people still go back to 
Judah because Jerusalem was sending in Judah to worship. So what he did, he created a rival system of worship whereby the people in Israel were supposed to go and worship there. And so the king of Israel always was in deep apostasy worse than the king of Judah, right? And this continued on. So let's read 2 Kings 17 verse 17, right? Speaking of the kings of Israel, 2 Kings 17 verse 17 says, And they caused their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire and use divination and enchantment, enchantments and sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord, to provoke him to anger. 2 Kings 17 18 says, Therefore the Lord was very angry with Israel and removed them out of his sight. There was none left but the tribe of Judah only. So we find that because of their continual idolatry, worshipping false gods, God removed his protection and they were taken out of the land or wiped out completely from the land of Israel, right? So Israel, those 10 tribes, they were removed from the land. Okay, so let's look at this. So 2 Kings 17 verse 23 says, And the Lord removed Israel out of his sight, and he, as he said by all his servants the prophets, so, so was Israel carried away out of their own land to Assyria until this day. So, what had happened was what? The king of Assyria took Israel, the ten tribes, captive. And what did he do? He spread them across. Until this day, no one really knows what happened to the ten tribes. They were completely lost in history. So the king of Assyria came, took them out, and then they were completely scattered throughout all the world. Remember, by this time, Assyria was the one who was ruling the world, the, the superpower, right? So that the, the ten tribes were completely lost and what happened to their land which was there right to king 17 verse 24 and the king of assyria brought men from babylon and from kuta from ava from hamath and from sephariam and placed them in the cities of samaria instead of the children of israel and they possessed samaria and dwelt in the cities thereof so what is samaria well samaria was the part where the ten tribes were all that part was called Samaria, right? So in that part of Samaria, what happened is the king of Assyria, once he uprooted all the ten tribes and spread them across and they were completely lost, he took Babylonians, he took Cuthats, and he took all these heathen nations because Assyria was ruling all the world. He took heathen nations, put them in the place whereby the ten tribes were, right? So what had happened, okay? To King 17 verse 27 it says, Then the king of Assyria commanded, saying, Carry thee, carry thee uh, thither one of the priests whom you brought from thence, and let them go and dwell there, and let him teach them the manner of the God of the land. So what had happened was because these people had come and they were dwelling in the place where the ten tribes were, that's Samaria, lions were coming and eating them. So the king commanded to say, hey, look, Take one priest and let them teach the people of the God of the land. Or they should teach them about Jehovah, right? So that the God of the land might not send the lions to eat them. So 2 Kings 17 verse 4 and it says, So these nations feared the Lord and saved their graven images, both their children and their children's children. So as did their fathers, so do they unto this day. So we find that the heathen nations, these ones, namely Babylonians, others, and all these nations when they came in they were taught about the true god so they feared god but they saved their own graven image it's like jehovah was just like one of the gods but they feared him as a supreme god but they didn't stop worshiping the other gods they just took god and incorporated him as one of that supreme being but they didn't stop worshiping the gods from which they came from right so i find that these people who had come in these heathens they were now called the samaritans why were they called the samaritans again because they dwelt in samaria so you had during the time of christ you had the samaritans who were these heathen nations which feared jehovah or god but they saved their own gods right they were pretty much a mix of idolatry there and then you had the jews which were namely judah benjamin and levi you see so they were these people and these three tribes are the ones which were called 
the Jews. And Christ was born from the tribe of Judah, you see. So that's the history. So you have two, the Samaritans and the Jews. That's why, <coughs> let's read uh, John 4 verse 19. We read it, but I'll just go straight to verse 20. <coughs> Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. So, the Samaritans, they worshipped in the mountain. Remember, the Jews and Samaritans had no dealings with each other, right? These were heathens and these were the people who worship God. These were idolatry uh, worshippers, idol worshippers, but these were worshippers of the true God. So there was a great prejudice against one another and hatred, right? So the Jews said, hey, we worship in Jerusalem, right? The Samaritans don't worship in the mountain. You see, so that's where this question is coming from. Okay, so what did Jesus say? John 4, verse 22. You worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. So Jesus is saying, Hey, look, you don't know what you worship, but we know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. Remember, salvation is knowing God in an experimental way. And these people were different idol worshippers, so Christ is just cutting cutting across her ideas. Uh, John 4 verse 23 says, But the hour comes and now is when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeks such to worship him. So, God was seeking not to be worshipped in Jerusalem or Samaria or in the mountain. Right? God was seeking worshippers who is going to worship him in spirit and in truth what is this spirit and in truth okay as we shall see the truth there represents the reality okay the truth there represents the reality not truth and error but truth as in reality for example if i bring um an image of a car a design right that is a model it's not the true car but if there is a true a real car which has an engine and it's moving around that's the truth the reality so worshiping god in the reality and also we have the spirit of the father so in spirit and in truth in reality not in these types and shadows that's what god was seeking that was the real issue but this woman was trying to say no you're worshiping in israel no it's in samaria it's in the mountains it's in jerusalem no that was not the issue jesus was not concerned about that right so let's continue why? Why was God seeking such worshippers? Because God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So, God is a spirit. Now, if you understand what God, uh, the meaning of the word God is a spirit, what, what does this all mean? Okay? Let's look at uh, Hebrews 1, verse 7 and 14. You know these verses. They say, of the angels, he makes them what? Spirits. Okay? So, we look at angels. Now, did angels visit humans? Yes, they did many times. So, we find that angels did visit Abraham. They did eat with him. That's Genesis 18, right? We find that angels visited also Hagar, right? We find that there are many times where angels visited humans, not only in the Old Testament, but even in the New Testament. Like, for example, the angels that opened the doors uh, for one of the apostles, right? The angel that came to Mary, Elizabeth, right? So, these angels had a physical form. But why do they say angels are spirits? Well, you just have to... Uh, go to 1 Corinthians 15 which says in the resurrection we shall have a spiritual body right so there's a physical body and then there's a spiritual what body that's what it's saying so God is a spirit which means to say God has a spiritual body now when when you whenever you speak about a body all people think, think it's just oh this is just physical no there is a physical body then there's a spiritual body when Jesus Christ was resurrected he had a spiritual body. He could walk into a room and completely be with them and then one minute he's vanished. Right? Spiritual body. You have more abilities. Okay? And even if you look at some of the promises, it says, The redeemed shall mount upon with wings as eagles. You shall be able to fly as the redeemed. So, that's not a natural body. That's a spiritual body. So, <clears throat> if you look at the angels... Uh, even if we got Daniel 9 verse 17 up to 24 it says whilst you are in prayer God was speaking to Daniel says whilst you are in prayer I was caused to fly swiftly angels can fly 
back and forth from heaven they don't need a mask they don't need a gas mask to give them oxygen they operate in the spirit they don't operate to the laws of physics that were restricted to so god is a spirit god has a spiritual body just as angels have a spiritual body are you following are you following the floor there right and they that worship him must worship him in spirit so if you're worshiping god you must be in the spirit okay you must partake of his spirit and also you must be in that reality you must understand what you're doing and be in that reality that's what god wanted the realities not these types but you go to this mountain you go to this place in jerusalem no those were not the realities that god was looking for right so let's look at this right acts 3 verse 22 true worshippers who are these true worshippers acts 3 verse 22 it says for moses truly said unto the fathers a prophet shall the lord your god raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you acts 3 verse 23 and it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people so moses saying look there is another prophet god raise up like unto me him you shall hear whoever will not hear this one will be destroyed from among the people so moses was saying there is another prophet like unto me the reality is coming right so let's look at moses how how was moses how did god use moses let's look at numbers 11 verse 16 and the lord said unto moses gather up unto me 70 men of the elders of israel whom thou knowest to be the elders of the people and officers of them and bring them unto the tabernacle of the congregation that they may stand there with thee so moses is asked hey look come to the tabernacle that's the sanctuary wilderness sanctuary bring 70 men who are elders and who are officers bring them they should stand with you right numbers 11 verse 17 says and i will come down and talk with thee there and I'll take of the spirit which is upon thee, and I'll put it upon them. They shall bear the burden of the people with thee, that thou bear not alone thyself. So notice, God was going to do something. He's going to take the spirit that was on Moses, that was one person, and put it on what? On all the rest. So it was God who was concerned. Right? The work was just too much for Moses, so he had to select officers and elders and all those things to judge into the smaller matters and the heaviest matters to judge by Moses. So we find that the spirit that was upon Moses, God was going to take that one and put it upon the rest. So the spirit that was upon Moses, it was God who put it upon him, right? And now God was going to take that spirit and also place it upon the others. So they could do a similar work that Moses was what? was doing so this was not the reality this is just moses the way it was right so let's look at this one okay so let us look at this reality now by going into john 1 verse 17 it says for the law was given by moses now we when we say the law it is the whole system of law right uh, God gave to Moses the Ten Commandments and together with them he gave him the system of law, right? Uh, that was the statutes, judgments and uh, sacrificial system. All this system was given by Moses, okay? It was God who gave it through Moses, right? Now, but grace and the truth came by Jesus Christ. The ones who were supposed to be uh, the ones who were supposed to be like the what? The actual elders right the ones who are supposed to judge in matters who are supposed to um, be the leaders with moses were the ones who were operating under this system of law right and remember it was god who took the spirit that was of moses and put it upon all these people so they could be able to function and operate right but god says hey look that was not the truth that was not the reality it doesn't mean that was error no it was god operating through moses all those things but god was just illustrating things that was not the grace that was not the truth because that was not the reality right so that but grace and truth or the reality of it came by who by jesus christ that was the reality that was to come so let's look at the reality acts 3 verse 25 it says you are the children now when you're reading acts 3 verse 25 we already read that moses had prophesied to say there's someone else coming it's in acts 3 so in, in applying who is this someone 
Acts 3.25, it's still continuing. It says, Yet the children of the prophets and of the covenants which God made with our father, saying, And Abraham and in thy seed shall the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Acts 3 verse 26 says, Unto you, unto you first God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you, in turning away every one of you from his iniquity. So we find that it was Jesus who was the other prophet who was to come. It was Jesus who was supposed to bless us and turn us away from our what? Our iniquities. Right? The system of law could not do that. The sacrifices of blood, of bulls, of goats couldn't do that. But it was Jesus who really could turn us away from our iniquities. So it was Jesus who came with the reality. It was Jesus who was this true prophet. Right? So now, let us talk about this. So, true worshippers, speaking of God, Romans 1, verse 20 says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. The word Godhead there, if you look at other versions, you just find it, it just means deity, right? So, all the things that are created, the evidences of God's eternal power and deity or divinity. Right? So, God possesses the fullness of divinity. That is without question. But notice, Colossians 1 verse 19, speaking of Christ, it says, For it pleased the Father that in him should all the fullness dwell. So, it pleased God that in Christ should all the fullness dwell. What fullness is this? Colossians 2 verse 9, it says, For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily right in jesus christ dwells all the fullness of divinity bodily right so what how did this happen it's praise the father so christ has the fullness of deity he has the fullness of divinity he has the fullness of the godhead in him for it pleased the father that this fullness should dwell in christ right <clears throat> so let's see uh New English translation in it, it says, for in, him, uh, for in him all the fullness of deity lives in bodily form. So, deity is just a translation of Godhead, right? It's not a big issue. Most people, when they read God, they think it's three. No, that's it's just speaking about deity. All right, let's continue. So, <clears throat> speaking of this, the reality, John 1 verse 16, it says, And of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. So, of the fullness that was in Christ, the fullness of what? Of deity, of divinity. We have received grace for what? Grace for grace. What is he saying? What is he saying? John 1 verse 17. For the law, the system of law, <coughs> was given by whom? By Moses. And with Moses who came in? The 70 elders, officers. What were they to do? They were supposed to help Moses in dealing with the matters. The burden was not supposed to be on Moses alone, but they were supposed to share. What Moses was able to do, they were to do how? Go to take the spirit on them, put it on, put, take the spirit from Moses, which was there, and put it also on these people. So, what that happened, the laws given by Moses, what that system was doing? Grace and the truth came by who? By Jesus Christ. I don't know that those seven elders and officers, they were dealing with the law of Moses which also had the statutes and the judgments, right? But the grace, the reality, and the truth, the reality, is coming by Jesus Christ. So we have to dig deeper into this issue, right? How did we receive of his fullness? How did the grace come? How did the reality come in Jesus? Notice, Acts 2 verse 16. I, lo ah, I love this. I love this. I love it. Okay, Acts 2 verse 16. It says, and this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. What was this? I mean, this was a prophecy from Joel too, right? It was a prophecy long back. Oh my goodness. The reality. Acts 2 verse 17. And it shall come to pass in the last days, God the, saith God, I will pour, pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Acts 2 verse 18. And on my servants and on my handmaids, I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. So God says, look, 
I'll pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Your handmaids, all of them shall what? Shall prophesy. Right? Now, if we read this, when was this fulfilled? Acts 2 verse 32 says, This Jesus has God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. Acts 2 verse 33. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed for this which ye now see and hear. On Pentecost, people had the gift of the Spirit. They were speaking in tongues. How did it happen? God says, I'll pour out of my Spirit. But how did God do this? Well, Jesus Christ received the promise of the Holy Ghost. And it was Jesus who shed it forth to those praying disciples on Pentecost. So we find the reality the reality christ as a man he could not be omnipresent humanity weighed him down it he was cumbered with humanity right as a man he couldn't be present everywhere else he was still divine yes but humanity is limiting right so when he had conquered sin and death he was the author of our faith they had authored a new humanity which sin did not touch right he was the second adam but this life was available in one only him so he had to go to heaven and receive the gift of the spirit he had to be anointed with the glory we'll talk about this right but for now let's understand that christ had to be anointed with the spirit now once he was anointed with this spirit remember moses he didn't have to bear the burden alone christ he was anointed with this spirit Right? Once he was anointed with this spirit, remember he had told the man, look, greater works ye shall do. Right? So once he was anointed with this spirit, guess what Christ did? He shed forth this on all of those praying disciples. All those who received him received this reality. Oh my goodness. I mean, wow. So they received this reality as Moses, God took the spirit and put it on these elders, and they all began to prophesy. Read, read the whole of the account. Okay, they all began to prophesy. Up to Joshua said, Joshua stood there, and Moses said to Joshua, Joshua, are you jealous for me? No, who took God? And all men be prophets. <laughs> Can you imagine what the heart of Moses? Right. So we find that the reality here. The reality came. The reality was here. Jesus, the other prophet. God anointed him with his spirit. And it was God doing this. And now that spirit was now shed abroad upon those people. And they also had the same spirit. And the same burden that Jesus had was now on them. Now they could share the joy of bringing souls to God. Bringing souls to the true fold of the Father. Right? Remember Jesus said there's one fold? Yes, one fold of the Father. So now, what Jesus' mission, it is also their mission. Because they have the same spirit. And let's read this reality. Come on. Galatians 4 verse 4 says, But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of woman, made under the law. He was made under the system of the law, which was there since the time of Moses. Galatians 4 5 says, To redeem them that way under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons, so the reality can come. How we are adopted as sons. Galatians 4 verse 6 says, And because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts crying abba father so as god anointed moses with his spirit and this spirit was shared upon upon the 70 elders so i find that on pentecost the reality came jesus had authored a righteous life and jesus was anointed on pentecost and this righteous life was shared abroad to all of us and even today it's there. This is the reality. And by this, we are sons of God. Ah, my goodness. There is so much there that we can study. But for now, we're just, we're just basking in this glory. Right? 
So what is this? There's so much you need to study this. <laughs> I mean, it's a whole sermon. I know I'm too excited, but we have to finish the lesson. So Hebrews 12 verse 18 says, For ye are not come unto the mount that might be touched, and that burned with fire, not unto blackness and darkness and tempest. Verse 19. And the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words, which voice they, they that heard entreated, that the word should not be spoken to them any more. For they could not endure that which was commanded. And if so, much as a beast touched the mountain, it shall be stoned or thrust through with a dart. And so terrible, verse 21, was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. Notice, this is talking about Mount Sinai, right? When they went into Mount Sinai, what happened? They were all afraid to say, hey, look, Moses, talk to God. We, we, won't, we don't want to talk to God. You talk to him. He tell us. You tell us what God says. Remember? They were fearful of God, right? So God said, hey, look, we are not come to Mount Sinai. We, we, we're not there anymore. That was not their reality. That is not how you approach me now. You worship me in spirit and truth now. You come to me through Jesus now. That was not the reality. The law came through Moses, right? But the grace and truth, come on, Jesus was born under the law, under the system, so that he could redeem us to himself, so that we could know and experience the one true God. And so that via that, through Jesus, we could be set free. My goodness, my goodness. Let's go Hebrews 12, verse 22 and 23. Hebrews 12, 23 says, But ye are come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels. So notice, where are we coming? You are coming to Mount Zion. Where is this? The city of the living God. Not to Jerusalem in Israel, Palestine. No. But to heaven itself. Heavenly Jerusalem. Why? What are we doing there? Hebrews 12, verse 23 says, To the general assembly and the church of the firstborn which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just made men perfect. Notice, you and I, when we come to Jesus, what, we, what happens? We receive this spirit. And when we receive this spirit, what happens? Our spirit is made just before God. And we worship in his spirit and in truth, a perfect spirit. The spirit of God and spirit of man we shall look at this we become one with god via this process of being born again and when this happened guess what we approach god freely as he revealed himself in christ we approach god freely and there is no fear at all no we come to him the heavenly jerusalem the city of the living god we join the communion of angels we are one with god this is the reality this is where god wants us to be the true church, the church of the firstborn. Those who are born again are part of this church. We are not talking about a denomination here, no. Many denominations have claimed to be the true church of God. But there can only be one true church made of those who are born again. Those who are in Christ, they are part of the body of Christ, of believers. Right? So this is where God wants us to be. This is where God wants us to be. Not in that place mountain samaria not in that place jerusalem not in this denomination not in that denomination or this fellowship group or that fellowship no 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 but to be found in christ to be found in the spirit to be found in the reality not in one place in jerusalem there no because moses people say no you know we need a church structure whereby there is a president like moses was a president general conference president then we need to have elders like president general uh, you know pres division presidents and then we need to have some 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 presidents below him right so there is all this denominationalism right okay so people are hung up on that they look at that structure in the old testament but that was not the reality no no no, no. that was far from the reality that was a type. Moses was a type for Jesus. Moses represented Jesus the way he was. As Jesus was, how many elders were there? 70 elders and officers, right? And who were they all listening to? Moses, because Moses heard the instructions from the Father, God, right? 
Okay? So we found that Jesus, we are all under Jesus. There is no structure or a denomination or hierarchy structure whereby we go to, whereby if we join that one, that denomination will be part of the church. No. There are many fellowships. There is no problem joining a fellowship. There is no problem joining a group to fellowship together, to meet and to worship. There is no problem with that. The problem comes when these groups set up man-made structures and they lock people into the belief that once you are part of us, you are part of the true church and you are saved. That brings chaos. But the reality is, if you are in Christ, you are part of of the true church just as in the old testament you had to go to jerusalem you had to be circumcised you had to partake of the feast you had to be an israelite whether you were not born a jew for you to gain interest into god you had to be part of this system but now to gain an interest to god all you have to do you have to be in christ well, that's the issue the fold of the father john 10 we have to be in christ and if you're in christ he gives you his spirit this is the reality. And you don't have to fear God. You don't have to join some group here or there. No. The time is come. Those worshippers must be worshipping God in spirit and in truth. In the reality. Not in this denomination, Samaria. Not in that denomination, Israel. No, 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 no. Because the Jews felt like they knew so, so much. So there are certain groups of Christians who feel like because they have all this knowledge, they are the true church. And then they claim other groups don't know much then they are Samaritans they are Babylon right they, there's all these ideas but the reality is this if you're in Christ you are born again then you're part of the true church and you're saved right whereas denominations claim to be part of the true church and many people join those churches they pay honest tithes there right and what happens Many don't have the assurance of salvation. They have this false assurance because they are part of this denomination. They don't know God. So this is where God wants us to be in the reality. Worship us in spirit and in truth. Right? So let's look at this. Galatians 4, 24 up to 26 says, Which things are an allegory? Allegory means a parable. For these are the two covenants. Two covenants. Oh, yes. The one from Mount Sinai, which genders to bondage, which is Hagar, Arga. So Arga, remember Abraham had two wives. There was Arga to her was born Ishmael, and then there was Sarah to her was born uh, Isaac, who was to be the heir. And uh, Hagar was a slave, right? Okay. Anyways, you know the stories, but let's continue. Galatians 4:25. It says, "For this Arga is Mount Sinai in Arabia." So Arga represents Mount Sinai in Arabia. And answer is to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with our children. So, the Jews, they still went to Jerusalem to keep the feast and all these things. And Christ was lost to them. They rejected him. So, that system was now bondage. Though God had created that system, it had outlasted its use. And now, instead of pointing to Christ, it now became a blinding mechanism. It now became bondage right that system there galatians 4 26 says but jerusalem which is above which is free is the mother of us all so now since we are looking at two women Hagar and uh the wife of uh, abraham sarah right jerusalem which is above represents sarah who is a woman and jerusalem which is below it represents Hagar, who is also a woman so they're saying jerusalem which is above which is free you are free in christ there's freedom this one is the mother of us all meaning to say if we are to meet god we are supposed to meet him in heaven in jerusalem how do we do that by faith if you're in christ you're a new creature where there are two or three gathered if you meet both of you are born again there christ is no need to be part of that denomination or these denominations no no need you just need to be in christ can you fellowship with brethren yes by all means can you meet with brethren from a denomination? No problem. But with this understanding in spirit and in truth, that is where the reality is. We are free in Christ. There is freedom. Right? So, now, with this understanding, that's where you begin to see 1 Corinthians 6, 17. Powerful verse. It says, But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Once you are joined to the Lord, you are one spirit. 
you are one spirit. Now you can worship him in spirit and in truth. What is the reality? The reality is not in your denomination. People just cut copy paste from Israel. They cut it out. They put their denomination there. But that's not the reality. To be one spirit of the Lord, to be born again, that is to have the spirit of the Lord. The spirit which was poured on Christ is now poured onto us. That is the reality. Hebrews 2 verse 13. Now, who is Christ the everlasting father of brethren? Come on. Hebrews 2 13 says, And again I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I am the children which God has given me. So, once we are born again, we become part of the children God has given Christ. And by that, we become the children of Christ. Now, if we are children, Christ is our what? You guessed it. Christ is our father. So, Christ is as being born to us he became the everlasting father and you can read this 1 Corinthians 15 it's so clear uh, Jesus says the first man was a3 the last man is the man from heaven talking about Christ the second Adam Adam was the father of us all and he brought us sin but one man his righteousness brought us eternal life so Christ is the new father of the human race to those who are born again he is freely offering himself to all of us but if we are born again, we can come to him and accept of this new birth. So, how does this happen? 2 Peter 1 verse 3 it says, According as his divine power has given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. Verse 4 says, Whereby given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you may be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So, when we partake of this divine nature, what are we partaking of? We are partaking of the spirit that is given us. As Moses, God partook of that spirit and gave it to these seven elders. So too, on Pentecost, God, Christ was anointed. We shall look, there's so much there, there's so much richness there. Christ was anointed and that spirit is placed upon us so there's just one more verse i want us to look at so in closing let us read this numbers 11 verse 25 the reality and the lord came down in a cloud and spake unto him and took of the spirit that was upon him and gave it unto the 70 elders and it came to pass when the spirit rested upon them they prophesied and did not cease verse 26 but there remained two of the men in the camp, and the name of one was Eldad, and the name of the other Medad. And the Spirit rested upon them, and they were of them that were written, but went not out unto the tabernacle, and they prophesied in the camp. So these 70 orders, what happened? They began to what? To prophesy, right? And uh, notice, they did not cease to prophesy, okay? The spirit that was on Moses was put upon them and they didn't cease. They kept on to prophesy. This was the type. This was not the reality, remember. Uh, Numbers 11 verse 27 says, And there ran a young man and told Moses and said, Eldad and Meldad to prophesy in the camp. Numbers 11 verse 28, And Joshua the son of Nun, the servant of Moses, one of the, his young men answered and said, My Lord Moses, forbid them. Numbers 11 verse 29 And Moses said unto him, Even thou for my sake, would God that all the Lord's people were prophets, and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. You see, this was the understanding of Moses. Would the Lord that all his people were prophets? Come on now. Moses had the spirit. And this spirit was placed upon these people. And they prophesied. Who prophesies? Who called? Who is called that prophesied? It's the prophet. So these people were acting the role of Moses. As Moses was, they were also. Because the same spirit was upon them. Right? So let's look at this. We looked at this verse already. So I'll just go on straight. And it shall come to pass, In the last days, saith God, I will pour of my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your old men and uh, shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams young men sorry young men shall see visions your old men shall dream dreams you see this right this was god actually trying to bring us back to the type illustration during moses time and to bring us to the reality in christ you and i are called upon to be true worshipers 
Are you going to accept Christ? Are you going to accept the Spirit of God? Right? Are you going to be a true worshiper? This is the call that God wants. God wants us to realize that our safety is not in any particular denomination. We are not bound to that denomination there or this denomination there. We are not bound to a particular place as Jerusalem located on earth. We are not to have a Jerusalem center whereby our safety is supposed to be there. No. We are supposed to be in Christ and to believe and to know the reality. The reality is those who are in Christ have received of the Spirit of God. And if this is true, then you and I should have the same works that Christ had. Jesus said, the, the works that I did greater will you do. This is our reality. Have you accepted it? Have you embraced this reality? This is what God is calling us to do. He is our everlasting Father. The life that he lived, that righteous life that he lived, is given unto us by via the Spirit. We are made righteous the moment that we are born again. And what is made righteous in us? It is the Spirit. Right? Thus we, we approach God by the righteous life of Christ. Right? That's why we have no fear with God. God is our Father. He is our loving Father. He embraces us. The reality we have of God is the reality. Not in the Old Testament, no. But in Jesus Christ. This is the reality. I hope you are blessed. May you continue to share this YouTube channel to others so that others may also be blessed. May you subscribe to our channel. We also give this video a thumbs up because whenever you do that, YouTube will suggest our content to similar users uh, who are just like you, who are searching for similar um, content. So YouTube will actually suggest it to that. So continue being blessed. May God guide you. Amen.